Yeah, okay. All right, good morning, everyone. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I bring greetings from our church in um, Edgewater, Florida. A um, number of folks will ask us here about where are we, and um, if you know where Daytona Beach is, if you know where Orlando is, we north northeast of Orlando. Um, you know where Daytona Beach is? We're just about 20 minutes from Daytona Beach south, and next to, you get New, uh, Daytona Beach, Port Orange, New Smyrna Beach, and Edgewater. And so we're up in Edgewater, our church, and the ministry is doing well there, and we're thankful for that ministry. And I bring greetings from that ministry to you. I'll maybe over the next day or so tell you a little bit more about what's going on in Africa with the ministry there and the missions there. But this morning, let's get on with the message because I'm sure you guys want to go for lunch. And um, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I, I, the, the guys that preached last night, Brother Ted Fellows this morning, um, uh, Brother Redman and uh, is it Red, Frank Redman, right? Um, by the Perry Lemons, they all did a great message. And I should just come up here and say, ditto, amen, walk the set down, okay? <laughs> because uh, uh, they built a real great platform. My message this morning is entitled, Defending the Faith. Defending the Faith. And so let's go read 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll go read from verse 7 there. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may, all, they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, I shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth what? Faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house... They are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So we're going to read that far, and we'll go back to some of these verses this morning. Let's give a word of thanks. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can consider it, and we thank you that you gave us an understand, understanding in all things. So we pray this by Christ Jesus alone with thanksgiving. Amen. So my study this morning is to demonstrate that dispensational Bible study is the only approach that will both identify and defend sound doctrine, Okay. And so, and um, when Paul starts off in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus and Philemon, look at what he says in 1 Timothy. Turn with me there. Because what is going to happen with, with sound doctrine, what's going to happen with the issue of once you, once, you, once you and I understand sound doctrine, once you and I understand the word rightly divided, we're going to find out there's people departing from that. There's going to be a falling away from the truth of God's word. And the satanic policy of evil is to do what? Is to take you from sound doctrine to false doctrine. Okay? And we have to guard against that. We need to defend the faith. We need to defend the, the truth of God's word rightly divided. Okay? And to do that, we need, we need approved workmen that have studied to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be what? Ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the only way by which we can shun. But it's the but only way which we, by which we can avoid. That's the only way that we can, by which we can flee false doctrine. Okay, and these vain and, 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 and profane things that's going on, it's by sound doctrine. When Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, I, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other what? So that tells me that somebody was preaching what? 
other doctrine, not sound doctrine, right? And neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly ed edifying which is in faith, so do. So what is Paul after when, when Timothy have to set things in order is what is going to bring godly edification to the body of Christ, not what is going to diminish the godly edification and, 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 and break down what, has been, what, what God has set up. You understand? And to do that, you need to be a workman as what? Approved, okay? You need, you need to be a vessel unto honor to defend those things and to stand for those things. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the what? Wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is those words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is those the words of the Lord Jesus Christ he did he preach in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Or is those wholesome words the word that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to the Apostle Paul? Okay, he say, uh, and it says, To the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to what? Godliness. Okay? And, and he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about question and strives of words, wherein cometh envy, strife, railing, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such, withdraw thyself. Can you see the, 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 what's going on here? And that's why Paul is writing these epistles, and God has given them by inspiration, so that we can defend and, 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 and guard the truth, okay? And, and rule in that, you know? He talks about the, 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 the office of a bishop, the one that ruleth well. What do you rule? Well, you make sure that the body of Christ and those, those that you lead and you, that you teach, that they function within the boundaries of the doctrine. As soon as you're out of that, out, you're out of rule, and you have to come back into rule. Okay? So what we need to do is, we, if we want to do this and we want to defend the faith, what we, you know, we, we, do, we, don't, we don't want to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Okay? And that's why we have to give attention to what? Sound doctrine. That's what's going to edify it. And to have that sound doctrine, we need a sound approach. A sound doctrine approach, which is obviously that we've been talking about since last night and the sessions this morning. It, it's a dispensational Bible study, and, and that's what's been covered this morning, okay? With the dispensational Bible study, obviously what we have is we have to, I'm, and I'm going to say this, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend much time on that this morning, but I'm going I'm to tell you this. If you do not have a final authority that you trust 100% to be the inerrant, perfect Word of God, you can defend nothing. You need to be 100% sure that the Bible that you have, you trust, and it's perfectly preserved, okay? Or else you cannot defend anything, because what are you going to defend? If somebody points out a mistake in that, your defense is where? Because how, how are you not going to be wrong about what you're saying, right? And so you have to have absolute final authority. And what we need to do is we dispensational study to the, to the Scriptures, and I'm not going to spend much time on that because that's been covered this, uh, uh, the last few sessions, okay? We need to read the Bible literally. It says what it means, and it means what it what? says. You know, if you want to get spiritual lies from the Bible, you have to spiritualize everything in the Bible. And for that reason, we have to look with spiritual eyes at the truth of God's Word rightly divided and not spiritualize it, because from spiritualizing the Scriptures, you get spiritual eyes. You get that? That's a lot of words, but I hope you get it, okay? I know the accent is not going to help much, okay? But, you know, so, so and we may, as, must make, as we said, the distinction between prophecy and mystery. We must understand that all Scripture is for us, but not all of Scripture is written to us and about us. Everything is for our edification, but all is not specifically written to us and about us. We've, we've established that. We've seen that, okay? Then the second point is a sound doctrine identity, okay? Rightly dividing the word of truth will identify sound doctrine. Wrongly dividing the word of truth will not identify sound doctrine. You get that? And so that's what we need to do. Then we're going to need, and we'll look at this morning, a sound doctrine defense, okay? And right division and rightly dividing the word of truth defends sound doctrine. 
You guys get the picture right now? I can almost say amen and sit down, okay? <laughs> okay, and then the last one, and I don't know sure if I'm going to get to this point this morning, but, but you know, my heart is full of this, and, and I've, I've been really, you know, it's been, it's been something that has been on my mind for a long time, is a sound doctrine soldier or a sound doctrine servant. And it's somebody that is strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's somebody that's not striving about with words and arguing and, 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 and just be contentious all the time. But it's somebody that's following righteousness, that's following faith, that's following charity and following, following peace. It's somebody that is with gentleness and, 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 with me, and with, is going to be apt to teach. And, and the Second Timothy tells you that. And it's somebody that's going to be patient. And he's going to be meek to instruct those that oppose themselves. Because the way that you want to defend sound doctrine is those that oppose themselves, you want to instruct them with the truth of God's Word. But to do that, you've got to follow righteousness, you've got to follow faith, you've got to follow charity, you've got to follow peace, and live peaceably with all men. And if you're going to be angry and upset all the time, you defend nothing. Okay? Like they say down by us, you're not defending nothing, which is really, you know, you are defending nothing. Double negatives. Okay, let's, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> That's what we're going to have to do. So sound, let's go. We, we've established the issue. We have to rightly divide the word of truth, and we'll get to some of that now. But let's look at a sound doctrine identity. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's setting these things in order, and for the, church, the order of the local church, and 1 Timothy has set that up. And 2 Timothy, you know, we have Timothy. He's a young man, and he's, he's, he has this a, a, immense amount of responsibility Weighing on his shoulders, okay? There, and and this, here's his mentor, his spiritual father, if you will, uh, Paul the Apostle, that writes to Timothy as his beloved son. And he's, he is on his way out of this world. He's going to depart from this world. And Timothy now needs to set things in order. And get me tell you something, it is a fearful thing to do. It is a, it is a frightening thing to do if you don't have sound doctrine, Okay? And, 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 you know, and, and, he, and he's writing to Timothy, and he says, you know, you need to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, okay? He says to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of what? Of fear. I'm mindful of your tears, Timothy. I'm mindful of you possibly being ashamed of the testimony of, uh, 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 of the, uh, uh, the testimony of the, of the, I'm sorry, let me get it, um, Ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his fellow prisoner. Okay, because it's costing him. And for that reason, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Okay, because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of what? A sound mind. And a sound mind is going to be able to defend sound doctrine. Okay, so look at what he says there in chapter 2, verse Verse, am I going too fast, by the way? By the Frank Redmond was this morning was going tuk 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 you know, and I'm like, I'm gonna see if I can follow in his shoes this morning, okay? So so and I hope I didn't offend anybody when I did that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, <laughs> Second Timothy chapter two and verse seven. Paul says, Consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. He's a bit full of himself to say, consider what I say. And the Lord, if you want to understand what, you know, if you want understanding in all things, you've got to consider what I say. Listen to me. But it is true. If we don't consider what Paul says, we cannot have understanding in all things. Because it's the Pauline epistles, Romans 2, 5, 11, that brings the whole scriptures together and shines a bright, shiny light and focus in on the attention that we now can know how to rightly divide the word of truth. You don't have that without Paul, okay? And so Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. To consider means to fix and to exercise your mind on, carefully examine, to attend to it. Okay, and if we do that, you know what's going to happen? We will profit. We will profit, and our profiting says First Timothy chapter four will appear unto what all men. Okay, so when you profit from sound doctrine, guess who else is going to profit? Those that you deal with, if you deal with them according to sound doctrine. Now, if you deal with them according to pride and self-will and arrogance and contention, guess what? It's not going to appear to them. Okay, because you'll be an insult. To sound doctrine. 
Okay, and so we need to do these things. We need to give attention to what Paul says. And Paul is instructing T Timothy to carefully consider what he just told him in, 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 in the first chapter and in in part of that. And what he's going to tell him after that. And by the way, when he says, consider what I say, if you want to consider what Paul says, where do you have to go? You go to Paul. And you have to go from Romans to where? Philemon, Philemon exactly. And that's where you're going to consider what Paul says. And when you consider that, God, the Lord, will give you understanding in what things? In all things. Isn't that a deal? Isn't that a grand deal to know that, you know, if I understand and know what Paul is saying, I can have understanding. God's going to give me the understanding in all things. I got to obviously have to believe what Paul says. If I don't believe it, neither will God, you know, neither will it work in me that believes, right? I have to believe, okay? And so Paul says, you know, uh, Paul ne Timothy needs to consider this. Because why? Because Paul is the appointed apostle of this dispensation. But he's also, he's not just the appointed apostle of this dispensation. Paul is the guy, Paul is the person that God saved by His grace against all odds, who has committed an unpardonable sin. And God saves him against all odds and gives him eternal life. And that life is going to be entered into the where? Heavens, Paul cannot come and reign for a thousand years, but he can enter where? Heaven, right? And so Paul says, but, he, but he's not just the apostle of, of this dispensation. He is also the guy that fulfills the word of God, that God gives the final revelation that we need to bring the complete, the scriptures to what? Completions. And without Paul, the scriptures are not what? complete the whole realization of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the what earth without Paul's 13 epistles the, the what God designed in the beginning to do to fulfill and to complete cannot be done without Paul's epistles and that's why we have to consider what Paul says you get that because he's the appointed apostle go with me to first Timothy chapter 1 first Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11 <coughs> according to the glory, sorry, um, you guys with me there? I know sometimes I get start reading and I'm still hearing Bibles turning, okay? According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Who was the gospel of the blessed God? To whose trust was it committed? To Paul's, okay? And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for he counted me faithful putting me into the what? Ministry, who was before a what? Blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in what? Unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm what? He's not saying I'm the worst sinner out there. He says I'm the first one that's going to form a pattern for how to believe hereafter. And this next verse says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life what? Everlasting. So Paul is the appointed apostle. We've seen that. And it's of the utmost importance to give attention to what Paul's writing. Okay? When Paul is praying for the church, go with me to Colossians chapter 1, if you will. Uh, he's praying for this and to, under, to get understanding in all things. Colossians chapter 1, Paul's prayer is for the believers and then the prayer is for us. And we should have this prayer among ourselves as well. As he writes to the Colossians in chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, he says, For this course, verse 9, did I say verse 9? I did it in my mind, but I don't know if I said it out verbally. Verse 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Where do we find the knowledge of God's will? In the Scriptures, right? Do we find it only in Romans to Philemon or do we find it from Genesis to Revelation right through? Yes. Okay, knowledge of His will in all wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding. It's wisdom and spiritual understanding that's going to help us to do what? Rightly divide the word of truth. And no one understand how to defend that sound doctrine. Why does he pray that for the church to be filled with the knowledge of his will 
in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We have to consider what Paul says. And when we consider it, and the prayer is then that we might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding. And as we consider what Paul says, by the way, who gives the increase? I know I'm going to preach a great message this morning, or maybe not a great message. You know, we'll have the scorecards reveal that later. But, you know, and, and I'm going to preach a message, and I am going to give you the increase that you need. No, no, no. It's, that's why, why do we, we have to preach the what? The Word. And as you believe the Word, God works in you and reveals it into you, and He makes it known in, in your heart, and He gives the what? Paul says, I've planted, Apollos watered, but who gives the increase? God gives the increase, and that's what we need to do. Now, go back with me there to 2 second, second, um, Timothy there. It says, we need to consider what Paul says. We understand that, and we've seen that. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. And then in verse 8, verse 8, he says, he says, remember, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead According to my what? According to Paul's gospel, Jesus Christ of the seed of who? David was raised from the what? Dead. So that's an interesting message. And, and as, he writes to, as, he, as he writes to Timothy, he says, remember. So what is he telling Timothy? I've told you this before. You know this. But I have to do what? I have to remind you. Remember, Timothy. Remember to exercise your memory, okay? And that's why you preach the Word, to exercise people's what? Memory sometimes, right? If somebody, is, somebody opposes himself and they go away from the truth, what do you do? You bring them into remembrance. You're instructing in the truth, okay? And you bring them in, okay? He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, it's no, it's no secret that Jesus Christ was of the seed of David, right? It is, it, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that, and various other passages tells us that Jesus Christ was of the seed of David. He, says, he is, he is, um, he is uh, um, the seed of David and, and, and of Abraham, right? The son of David and the son of Abraham, right? Even Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, quickly go with me there, in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of what? You know what? As Paul preaches Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, he cannot preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery if Jesus Christ wasn't of the seed of David. Think about that for a second. Okay. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, who was made of the seed of David according to the, uh, to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the what? From the dead. So Paul says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the gospel according to uh, was raised from the dead according to what? My gospel. Paul's my gospel, we know, was part of of the mystery. It's the, and we've heard Romans 16, 25 being said to us and everything. Let me go read that too because we need to, you know. You know the proper way of teaching somebody is you tell them what you're going to tell them and then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them. Okay? I think we need to have a, we need to have a conference one of these days um, and, and this conference needs to have only one verse and every preacher that preached every sub-message has to preach the same verse. And by the end of the conference, we will have a good understanding of that verse at least, you know. <laughs> or we'll be completely confused, okay. Verse 25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to what? My gospel. If the believer in the body of Christ wants to be established, he needs to be established according to who? Paul's, my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the what? Mystery. Not according to prophecy, but according to the revelation of the what? Mystery. It's, in, it's of quintessence that, that we know that the preaching of Jesus Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is the only thing that will establish a saint in the body of Christ today. 
We got to get that, and we need to understand it. And he says, he calls it my gospel, okay? But was the resurrection a mystery truth? Was the resurrection of Jesus Christ a mystery truth? And no, it wasn't a mystery truth because the prophets were looking forward to a resurrection. They told about a resurrection. Moses was looking forward to a resurrection. Job was talking about a resurrection. The old scripture is talking about Jesus Christ when he's teaching his own disciples. And for time, I'm not going to go to the verses. He's preaching his own disciples of his resurrection. He told the nation of Israel about what? When he was preaching about his resurrection, the resurrection was never a secret. The twelve was witnesses to the what? There's a resurrection. So what is Paul meaning when he says Jesus Christ uh, of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel? What was he meaning when he was said that, okay? According to my gospel. Paul's preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery was distinct from any other gospel that Jesus Christ was preached about. It was to stink in the sense of when, you know, Paul and Peter talked about the resurrection. They preached about the resurrection. But when Peter preaches about the resurrection, he's preaching the resurrection to prove that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. The res- without the resurrection, Peter cannot stand up at Pentecost that he was the Christ. Because if he was still dead, guess what? He didn't come for his people. He was a false, false Christ. But he was the Christ because the resurrection proved that he was what Israel had to believe, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. You get that? But Paul preaches the resurrection. He preaches the death, burial, and resurrection for all men's sin in spite of Israel's fall. In spite of Israel's failure, God provides for you and I eternal life through the finished work of Jesus Christ's death burial, and resurrection, which brings your and my justification in spite of the nation of Israel. Okay? In spite of them falling. Because the way that God was going to reach the Gentile was going to be through who? Israel. But Israel failed. The program changed. And now we have Jesus Christ preached according to the revelation of the what? mystery, and this mystery tells you that you are justified by the finished work of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection without that Israel's prophetic national program. Everybody should jump up now and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, okay? (laughs) Because that is great, fantastic. A Gentile is preaching to you about Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection, about His secret and about His mystery. If you try to do that in time past, guess what? You know, you'll be in trouble, okay? So what Paul's gospel brings us in the preaching of, of, of him, we have to consider what Paul says. And, 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 and according to Paul's gospel, you know what brings us? It brings you and me a new identity. It brings me a standing that I have in Christ Jesus. It brings me a, a, a place of being seated together in heavenly places in Christ. It makes me complete. It have, makes me have His imputed righteousness. It brings me that I'm risen with Christ. I can know the power of the resurrection. And I can know that He's the head of the body of Christ. That's what His gospel brings me. And you know what it brings me ultimately? What, what Brother Ted was talking about last? My ultimate glorification. The sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's what He's going to do with us. And that's that's where our destiny is going to be. And it's Paul's my gospel that brings this to us. And that's why it is so important that we give attention to God's word rightly divided to 2 Timothy 2.15. To defend that and not to mix law and what? And grace. And by the way, Paul says he suffered trouble as a what? Evil doer. You know, Paul says, you be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, and of me, his fellow what? Prisoner, okay? And Paul says, he suffered these things. Let me tell you, if you're preaching Jesus Christ according to Paul's gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery, it brings suffering from unbelievers and so-called believers. Not even so-called believers. Some people are believers, but they'll... They, 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 they got saved through the finished work of Christ, and they still will persecute if you preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. But Satan, above all, hates 
absolutely hates the liberating message of God's grace. And it's his policy of evil to corrupt God's word and to take that away from you and to bring you into a, a mixed uh, 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 gospel and a mixed message of law and grace and of prophecy and mystery and just spiritualize everything because we all feel good and happy and just whatever, you know. And we emotionally stirred and he's happy with that message. He's happy when somebody stands up on a pulpit and preach to 40,000 people and tell them about, you can just say, I am, because you're your own God and stuff like that. He, he rejoices in that. But when you stand up and say, you are complete in Christ, and you're nothing of your own, but it's through the finished work of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, that He brings you a standing before God with imputed righteousness that you don't deserve but by His grace through faith, gives you freely. You don't want to hear that, okay? He don't want you to walk in, in, in that. So, so that's why we need a sound doctrine defense against the satanic policy of evil who wants to corrupt the Word of God. And to do that, and to do that, go with me to 2 Timothy. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 14, or well, let me read verse 15 to you first. You, ha you know the verse, but look at your scriptures, look at the Bible. Let's read that verse in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto what? A God, a uh, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now you and I, we all know 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, right? It's a verse, it's a key verse for us to look at God's Word dispensationally and to rightly divide it, right? It's a key verse. But have you noticed where that verse is smack bang in the middle of? When he's telling Timothy to be strong in the grace, to be a good soldier, to be a vessel unto honor, to be, to be, to, 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 to sanctified and meet for the master's use, he's telling you what you need to do, Timothy. You need to study to show thyself approved. But before that, it's a verse 14, he says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Right? Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain what? Babblings, for they will increase unto more on godliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. So right between two verses that he's telling us, one is to strive not about to words to no prophets. The only thing that that does, it's overthrow the faith of some, if you're striving about words to no prophet. And the other one is to, 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 to shun profane and what? How will you avoid striving about words of no prophet? How will you and I, as in, in, as 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 as, as, as sound doctrine servants as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ defend the truth of God's Word and sound doctrine with, with uh, uh, um, <laughs> if, if, if they're striving about words and there's, there, there's, there's uh, a vain and profane babblings. The only way that you can shun it and the way that you can avoid it, the only way that you can flee from it is to rightly divide the Word of truth. That's the big thing that's going on, Okay. Satan is not this evil, well, he's the evil guy, okay, but he's not this person dressed in red with the two little, you know, little horns and a little tail and, and walking around you and moving the by and he's out there just to get you into the bad things and, and all that. No, what he's going, he's slyly, his ministers are ministers of righteousness. They come into the church, they infiltrate the church and they throw a little striving about words in. And they bring these things slightly and, and surely, slowly but surely brings it in. And profane and vain babblings. And he's mixing law and grace and he brings it in. And before you what, you know what, you know what? There's a canker in the church. And guess what happens? It splits this whole thing apart. And people are off preaching some profane and vain and, 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 and doctrines out there. And they depart it from the truth, which Paul says is going to happen. And that is why we need to study to show thyself approved unto God, okay? And so he says, what you need to do, Timothy, of these things, put them in remembrance. Place it in front of them, Timothy. Place it in their minds to bring them to remembrance. 
Peter says, when he's writing to, to, the, to the little flock, he says, I stir up your, your pure minds by way of remembrance. And what you have to bring is sound doctrine to their what? Remembrance. Because that's what it's going to, you know what sound doctrine does? What the truth does? It exposes error. It exposes error. And that's why we need to preach sound doctrine. That I strive not about words to what? To no profit, but to the subverting of the only thing that it's going to do, striving about words is going to do, it's over going to throw the faith of some. And that's sad. How much time we in the body of Christ spend striving about words when the lost has not even heard the gospel of God's grace. And the lost is looking at us fighting and arguing about stuff that is no profit in. If I was a lost person and I see believers fighting and arguing and name-calling the way that's going on, I wouldn't want to be a believer because what, what attracts me to that? And Paul says, you know one of the greatest things you can do, Timothy, is you need to strive. Put them in the remembrance of sound doctrine, bring remembrance of these things, that they strive not about with words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Shun profane and vain babblings, Timothy. And the key is to rightly divide the word of truth. And that's why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study. The word study just means to endeavor. To means to be diligent. You can look that up in an in a English dictionary. Study means to endeavor, to be diligent, to be earnest. Okay? That word study is the same, same word that Paul uses in, 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 in Ephesians. Go with me to Ephesians, if you will, quickly, verse chapter 4. Ephesians 4 uses the same word, and I'm not going to give you a Greek salad now before lunch, okay? <coughs> but if you go in a TR, you'll see it's exactly the same word that's used in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, and in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It's the same word. In chapter 4 and verse 3, it says endeavoring. That word endeavoring. To, it's the word study, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? In the bond of peace. So what we need to do is to study. And, and when it comes to studying God's Word, you know, I say this over and over and I can't say it enough. You cannot study God's Word like you study a biology book or a, 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 a geography book. You cannot study it like that. Because to study means you just need to give yourself to it, give attention to it, endeavor, get into it, read it. Because what happens when you do that and give attention to it and as you believe it, it works in you. It's a spiritual book. It's got w living words in it. It's not static words on a page that you learn like a parrot. But it's words that's on a page that's living. It's God's eternal living word. And as you read it, it reads you, and God works in you effectually as you believe it and, it, and it works in you and produces in you what God intends for you to walk in. Uh, keep your hand there and go with me to Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Folks know this is one of my favorite verses because this is verses that really got me going into understanding God's Word effectually working and understanding what, what God's Word is doing and understanding a living book. In verse 13, he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of what? Men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God which effectually worketh also in you that what? As you believe God's Word, it works effectually in us that believe in God by His Spirit works in us and produces us the, not just the knowledge of His will, but wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding so that you can uh, be an approved workman. And that's why Paul says, study to show thyself approved. To show means to prove, to present yourself, to exhibit yourself, something to be seen. Okay? It's not, it's not about you giving fair speeches. But it's by, by you understanding what God's Word is saying, understanding sound doctrine, understanding rightly, the Word rightly divided. But being a study to show thyself approved unto God. Approved means accepted and tried. There's a word in the Bible that is the opposite of being approved. And go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 
verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And, ev and, 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 and every man that striveth for the... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm starting to read and I'm still getting pages going. You guys got 1 Corinthians chapter 9? I'm running against a clock here, man. It's 9, 49, 48, 47. Let's go. Verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are what? Incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a what? Cast away. Not cast away, it's cast away, okay? A castaway, and that word mean, it means just to be unapproved. It's the opposite of what 2 Timothy 2, 15 says. Study to show thyself what? Approved unto God, okay? And by the way, there's many, <laughs> there's many people that, that, that approve themselves as God's spokesman, but it's not who you, who you it's not, <laughs> for it's not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord, what? Commend, commendeth, okay? And so, so, this is what we need to do, you know. If we're going to preach the gospel and we're going to be in defense of sound doctrine and we're going to defend the faith, we need to study to show ourselves the proof to God because it's a proved workman that defends sound doctrine. You get that? Okay. And when you're going to do it, you're going to do it soundly according to the doctrine, not according to your flesh, not according to your pride but according to sound doctrine. It's no longer I that liveth, but who? <coughs> Christ. Okay? It's according to sound doctrine. Uh, uh, it says, unto God. It's God that tries our heart, obviously. That's Him that we have to please. A workman that needeth not to be what? Ashamed. A workman means a, a teacher, a laborer, somebody that's skillful in the area. The first time that word workman uh, 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 appeared in your Bible, I think it's the first time, I could be wrong. But it's in Exodus chapter 35, when they were making the, the, the finishings for the, for the tabernacle. And in Exodus 35, he says, you know, God puts His Spirit on some of these men. And, 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 and what are they going to do? They're going to be skillful. They were cunning workmen. Skillful. That's what we need to be as cunning workmen, skillful. And what we need to do, God's not going to put His Spirit on us to do it supernaturally. What it's going to do is He's given us His whole, complete Word of God that we need to study to show ourselves approved, that we get into. And as we get into God's Word, it gets in us. And as we believe it, it starts working in us. And, 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 and we are filled with the Spirit and the Word of Christ dwells in us richly. And we become effectual workmen. We can become skillful in the area of defending the gospel, defending the faith, preaching the gospel. And our desire becomes that for God who have all men to be what? Saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's not about me winning battles. It's not about me getting, you know, a bunch of people on my the list that I have won to Christ. But it's all about the truth of God's word and about the defense and confirmation of what? The gospel. The word of truth. Okay? And, and, and what I'm saying is that, you know, a workman, you know, he is skillful, okay? We need to be good. Look at Paul says in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about Timothy. By the way, when I started this thing off and I wrote this message, or started making points for this message, I had 14 pages. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we got to work at this. We got it down to 12 pages. I got it about 8 pages. And I'm like, okay, I got too much here anyway. But it's good information, okay? And I'll preach a whole series on it. How about that? So, look at it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. If thou put the, bre uh, the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a what? Good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of what? That's God's word working effectually in you, right? Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast what? So what does a good minister do? He's somebody that's nourished up in the words of what? Faith. Okay, he's not a shop in the, in, 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 in the words of faith and of good doctrine. And it's a good minister that puts the, the brethren in remembrance of these things. It's somebody in 2 Timothy, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I know I'm not going to get to this, but in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in all light of everything he's saying in the context of 2 Timothy, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. 
The Lord knoweth them that are His, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from what? Iniquity. You know what is, for me, that He's saying there, depart, who, and who was iniquity found first? And Satan. Why? Because he was full of pride. He wanted to be like the Most High God. He wanted to exalt it himself. You know what, the, what, a, what somebody that follows youthful lust does? It's pride. It's iniquity. And we need to depart from that prideful, full of ourselves, argumentative, quarreling and striving, and get away from that. That's how we depart from iniquity. It says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. doesn't matter what position you hold in the body of Christ. And some of us are gold and some of us are silver and some of us wood and some of us clay. You could be a clay vessel or, or, or an earth vessel or a wood vessel, and you can still be a vessel unto honor. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto what? Honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every what? Good work. What is God's word and sound doctrine going to do me an approved workman? He's somebody that is sound in doctrine, nourished up in the words of faith, in a good doctrine. He's somebody that's a vessel unto what? Honor. An approved workman. A vessel unto honor. And, and sanctified and meet and prepared, uh, meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. He is not somebody that's full of self. He's somebody that has been nourished up by the doctrine. And he rightly divides the word of truth. And he can identify when error is going to creep into the church. And I pray on a regular basis, O oh Lord, that my understanding of your word be so that when somebody comes and asks a question, and want to stri- you know, there's so much striving going on today and about stupid things that's got no eternal value. And we get bent out of shape if somebody don't see my view. And when you get into that avenue and you start going down that road, I'm telling you, you're not a vessel unto honor. You're not sanctified and meet for the master's use. Because it's not about you. It's about what God ultimately does through you in the, through the finished work of Jesus Christ. He says, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. You know, youthful lust is not talking about sexual lust and stuff like that. That's natural. We know that. But he's talking about pride, wanting to be right. You know what young people always do when you tell them something? Always have to want to say something back. <laughs> but stature, you know, I'm going to prove myself. I'm a younger, I'm going to prove myself. You bump me, I'm going to bump you twice as hard back. Okay? He says, flee also youthful eyes, but follow what? Righteousness. That which is right. What God has created us these, we have His righteousness, faith, sound doctrine, the, the, what the Word is doing, charity. What is charity? Charity is the benevolent love of is God's love working out. It says it's walking in love is charity. Peace. Paul says, live peaceably with all men. Okay? But foolish and unlearned... Uh, 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 it says, uh, sorry, with them that all call... Verse 22, with them that all call... On, uh, that, that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What is, how does a pure heart get established? By what? By faith. But foolish and unlearned questions, what do you do with those? How will you avoid them? How do you will avoid a foolish and unlearned question in your church or in your ministry? How would you avoid that? The only way that you can avoid that is to be sound, have sound doctrine in you, is to have the Word of God, understand it, rightly divided, because you know where that question is going to go. And a lot of times, that question is asking, let me ask you just something. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, preacher, let me ask you something. When he says it like that, I'm like, that's a foolish and unlearned question, because he's trying to trap me. He's going to try to bring me around to his thinking. And so we be careful. And the only way that we can avoid those and knowing that they gender strife, the only thing they give us birth to strife, what we need to do is to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Make the distinction between prophecy and mystery. God's plan for heaven and plan for the 
plan for earth and plan for the heaven, okay? Make a distinction between Israel and, and the body of Christ. Knowing, make it, um, rightly dividing the word of truth. Looking at time past, but now, and what? Ages to come. Because if somebody asks a question like that, okay? If somebody asks a question like that, you can know exactly where his question fits in if you know time past, but now, and ages to come. If you know the word are rightly divided and approved workmen and nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, and you have it down, you can identify what you should shun, what you should avoid, what you should flee from, and what you need to get and, and just avoid completely. Because you know the only thing is that goes down to the road of satanic policy of evil is to corrupt God's word and to split what God is doing. And we must not be ignorant, brethren, of Satan's devices. Because he'll he, look at what the verse is saying there further. And a servant of the Lord must, verse 24, and a servant of the Lord must not strive. Let me tell you something about me personally. I, I, I like to strive. I, well, I used to like to strive. And sometimes I still like to strive. That's my flesh. Okay? So, okay, kick me out now, all right? But the servant of the Lord must not strive. But what must he be? He needs to be gentle unto what? He needs to be gentle unto all men, okay? He needs to be gentle unto all men. He needs to be what? Apt to teach, given to it. Not to teach, not to argue, not to bring you and shame you for what you're thinking and what you know, but to, to bring you, to instruct you by the truth of God's Word so that I can rather edify you than do what? Break you down. He needs to be apt to teach and needs to be what? Patient. That is something that I would need. You deal with people and you give them something and next week they're still at the same place. I'm like, oh, you know, come on, man, you should have had this. Three weeks later, still the same place. Patient. And he says, in meekness, and I don't have time to go through all of this, but in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. How do you oppose yourself? You don't take note of truth. Because Satan, we need not to be, we do not to be ignorant of his devices. Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices. Be careful that you don't fall into the snare of the what? Of the devil. He's out there to get us. And so what we need to do is to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a work when it needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of what? Truth. That is what we need to do, okay? And so that we, we, we be apt to teach and we can be patient and in meekness instructing those ourselves. Uh, somebody that is, it's in, it, it, that's, that's, that's going to instruct somebody in meekness is somebody that's aware that you could fall into the same trap. But it's only the truth of God's Word. It's only sound doctrine that will reveal, you that, reveal that to you. He says, in meekness... Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Does he say maybe God will give them or maybe not will? No. God will give you if they acknowledge the what? The truth. Okay? Whether they can listen to you or not is another story. You know that word peradventure, the first time it comes into the scriptures, you know where's the first time peradventure is used in the Bible? With Abraham and Genesis chapter 18. He says, God peradventure, there be 50 souls in Sodom. God says, well, if it's 50 less 5, I will still save the city. He says, God, peradventure 40, peradventure 30, peradventure 20, peradventure 10. God says, if there's 10, I'll save the city. Guess what happened to Sodom? There wasn't even 10 righteous. He says, God, peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. How can they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil? By acknowledging the truth. Because... That is why you and I, with meekness and with gentleness and with patience, apt to teach, instruct those that oppose themselves so that they can have an opportunity to respond to the truth. But that is why we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Because an approved workman, a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, will help somebody, to instruct somebody, to bring them to the truth and to edify them and not to break them down. And as somebody that's going to be able to find where there's error. I didn't even get into Hermanius and Philetus today, 
who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. You know what? If you want to, you know, <laughs> if you want to throw, overthrow my faith today, you come and tell me that, uh, guess what? There is no resurrection. There's no, there, is, there is no putting from, from mortality unto immortality. There's no putting on from corruption to incorruption. There's no blessed hope. There's no escaping the wrath to come. But there is, right? Because, of the, because I study, I understand God's word rightly divided. I understand sound doctrine. And I know I escape the wrath to come. And right division will tell me when somebody wants to overthrow my faith. It's going to tell me when somebody is in error. And that is why we have to study. That is why we have to put our nose in the book. And let God's word effectually work in us that believe. To produce that life. Produce sound doctrine. So that we can be defenders of the what? Of the faith. And by the way, when you and I defend the faith. We're striving. Not as strive about words to no profit. But we're striving for the faith of the gospel. Okay? We're striving together for that, for the truth of God's word. And it's, it's not me that's really defending it. It's God's word effectually working in me. It's the life of Christ living out through me. I get out of the way and I allow God's word to effectually, sound doctrine to work in me. It's not about myself. It's not about my performance. It's all about the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the preaching of him according to the revelation of the mystery that we now have and working in us effectually. Then we stand in sound defense of the doctrine. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your provision of your word, your complete word. Thank you that it can work in us effectually that believes it. Thank you that we can understand it, rightly divide it. And rightly dividing the word of truth, dividing truth from truth, truth and prophecy from truth and mystery, and not mixing the two up. But, 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 but bring everything into clarity and placing it where it needs to be placed so that we ultimately, as we minister to people and as we in defense of the faith, that we can edify others and, 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 and build them up through your word and the truth of your word. We thank you for the finished work of Christ who died for our sins and was buried and rose again. Thank you for our eternal life and that we can receive that by plainly placing our faith in the faithfulness of Christ. And we praise you for these things by him alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jess. All right. Thank you, Des.